Hello, I'm Michael Redmond, professional online dongle player. In this video, uh, I'm going to look at the 33rd Mingguang title match, game one. So this is between Mi Yuting, who is the title holder, and KJ, who is the challenger for this match. It's a three-game match. Okay. And black invades the 3-3 point. KJ has the black stones. This is a, what I would call an AI opening. And when white extends at d15, black will usually just slide, you know, as he did in the game. Or black, with the latter favoring black, sometimes black can jump. Um, something like this, for instance, would be one of the josekis that you can see. So it would be like this. And white would be able to play away at this point. In the game, black just slided. And this is one of the most simple variations uh, with the direct 3-3 invasion. So it's, um, I would advise most players to play simply. Uh, it's good for players who sort of don't like this Joseki in general to play the simple extension at d15, keep things simple. So white invaded the top right corner, and now black plays the knight move. So this is slightly more, there's more variations to it. If white bumps against black and plays a hane, this is relatively simple, and black could play away, or um, so so something like this, or something like this would would be possible, um, or black could continue locally. Uh, when black continues locally, whether black cuts at p18 or plays this double honey, there's always this ladder um, in which if black can capture the white stone seven, uh, it's going to be good for black but uh, black cannot capture it in the ladder because white has the lower left corner. And so it's going to be a different game. So in this case, black would maybe extend, and it would be about even. In the game, white plays this move, which is known in the West as the Flying Daggers Joseki, because it is very dangerous. And so I guess that's where the name comes from. Um, actually, in Asia, we call this the Mi Yuting Joseki, because Mi Yuting is a player who played it... Um, earlier than most players, and with great success. So the Joseki was actually named after Mi Yuting because he played it so much. And of course, uh, KJ knows this. So uh, with the knight's move at 017, there's always the possibility that White's going to choose this Joseki. And I think maybe KJ was sort of inviting him to do so, because KJ has a plan here. So the thing about this Joseki is that Black tends to want to cover here. So this is um, it's sort of hard to explain. Black could play a simple variation, which would sort of, this would actually revert to a, an actual joseki. So if white, um, if black just extends there on the third line, it's relatively simple and it's close enough to even. So people who want to keep it, it simple, I would suggest this move. Or to take the variation that white played in the upper left corner, one of those two. But strong players, uh, for various reasons that are sort of hard to explain here, um, we, we want to play the, to cover here. And when this happens, white will cut here. So this depends on a ladder. If the ladder did not favor white, maybe it would be this fight where white cut here, in which case it would be more like this kind of variation. And this would be okay for black because black's going to end up playing on both sides and there's some potential that black can reduce the value of white's wall in the upper left. And it did take white a lot of moves, a lot of white, white invested a lot of moves in the corner to get that 10 point territory. So this is pretty close to even, but I would say it's playable, good for black, maybe. So white cuts here, and this one depends on a ladder. So the ladder has to be good for white for this to work. And the variation here is the game variation up to this point where white plays here and black pushes here. So for the time being, Q13 and S17 or Mi. So if white just extends here, black's going to play here. Uh, this is going to be bad for white's group in the corner. So um, I could go on for several more moves, but the, the more I show you, it's it's probably going to get more complicated. Um, but it's a, it's a bad variation for white. Basically, our black would just keep on pushing on the fifth line and after a while, the value of the cut at N17 would be disappearing. So like maybe once more, 
and black would be able to play here. So this would be a bad variation for white. Otherwise, if white answers in the corner, black's going to play here. This is a bit painful for white on the outside. So black's going to squeeze the whole thing. So it would be maybe this, this kind of variation where white would have to play the cut and play a lot of painful moves to capture the black stones. And this would be a good variation for black. So these two points are Mi, and what white does is white plays here. So this is the uh, the ladder I was talking about, is this one, where white has to be able to capture these three black stones in a ladder. Otherwise, it's not going to be so good for white. So it's this ladder, which in this board position, it's obviously going to be good for white, because there's only a white stone there. So when this ladder works for white, uh, black has to be careful, but also it was necessary for this to work, for the whole variation to work for white. So that was the ladder that you have to know. And KJ chooses a relatively simple way to handle this. So when black connects at 015, so uh, this is already uh, one of the more complicated ones, but when black does this, then we have this variation where there's cutting points all over the place. And um, it's not clear which one black is going to protect. Sometimes black even plays here and leaves all those cutting points. And it's pretty confusing. So I don't really recommend playing this. Um, I've seen uh, world champion class players messing up with this Joseki. So it's, uh, when compared to that, this one is simple. It's still making Miai of Q13 and S17. So if white plays on the outside here, this is going to be good for black. White's group in the corner is in trouble. So white plays here, and black cuts. And now, uh, with that, uh, white has a cutting stone at P13, which is working fairly well, and white can capture these two stones. So if black connects here, white can escape, and uh, it's not really working for black. Another joseki would be for white to play like this, and again, black would uh, probably push a few, a few times and eventually play something towards the side. And the value of this variation for black is that black 10 is reducing the value of white's wall on the left. So white's D-line D wall is not working so well when black gets to play an extension on the top side. And so this is okay for black. This is another way that white could capture the two stones. So black sacrificed the two stones and played an extension after all. So the position of this extension determined how the game continued, because if black had played here, it would have been relatively peaceful. And um, white might have switched to some other part of the board, like the lower right corner or something. But when black extended further, it's a bit more greedy, and white tends to want to invade here. So this, is, this started a new fight here. And this was, in a way, it was the decisive fight of the game. So black peeps here, and this is where white started playing moves on this side to set up a cut at N17. So white's whole plan here, it turns out it wasn't working so well. But um, white, white's idea is that he's going to cut at N17. So he has a plan here. And uh, what I would suggest he should have done is he should have pushed through here and played a honey underneath. So this is going to connect up to the uh, upper left group and white has cut at three, which is a kind of an important point. So in this variation, um, white's probably going to connect up to the, uh, the group in the upper left, although there are, um, there are a great deal of complications in this variation too. Um, so this is maybe what white should have done in the game. He forces with this. So white's given up something on the right side in order to set up this move. So this is uh, um, the stone pillar tesuji, or we call it the sekito in Japanese, where white uh, sacrifices two stones towards the edge of the board and squeezes from above. So the, the value of sacrificing two stones there is that it's going to reduce black's liberties. So for instance, if white had simply squeezed like this, then white would have three liberties and black would have, well, at least four liberties. This is really five liberties because white's going to have to play an extra move somewhere like Q19. 
but um, so white black easily wins the race to capture. When white extends here, this is going to fill uh, two of those liberties. So black captures, white squeezes. Black cuts, white squeezes like this. And if black were to connect, then white would connect here and start filling liberties. And black only has two liberties left. So white has three liberties and black has only two. So that makes it simple. A win for white. Therefore, black cannot connect the five stones. So this, in this way, the white tactic there, it worked. But interestingly enough, uh, for a number of reasons that I'll give, this was a bad result for white, and it was a great success for black, actually. Um, in the middle game, this game goes up to something like 90 so percent for black. It's in the 90s of percentage for a black win, according to Katago. So black was that far ahead, because mostly because of this squeeze. And this squeeze, um, was it, it was bad for white. So even though white has captured the cutting stones, it's not a success. And the reason for that, uh, one reason is that black has played both sides. So black got Sente to play at R6, has a nice position on the right side. So black has a good position on the right side. And also black has captured the two stones on the top side. So black has a strong position there. So this strong position on the top side, it also reduces the value of white's wall on the left. So that wall that white has on the D line is not working well to attack black. So that's already two or three reasons. There's also the fact that even when white captures those stones, uh, the five black stones, that thickness, it's not really going anywhere because black has solid positions on both sides. It means that there's nothing really that white can use that strong position towards the outside that he's created by capturing those five stones. I could also add that um, black has already squeezed these two stones. And in that way, black has made use of the, the local stone. So um, since they've already been used um, as much as possible and white already had a strong position in the corner, that was another reason for it being okay for black to sacrifice the five stones. So this whole variation was very well conceived by KJ and it gave black a, an advantage. Okay, so white plays the submarine attack and then cuts here. So white's trying to set something up. Uh, basically, the idea is that if black case, plays a ko now, white has a ko threat in the corner. So for instance, if black cuts here, white's going to play a ko and probably going to use this one as a ko threat. So white's stones on the right side, they're relatively light and the corner is actually probably more important. And so this is a good way for white to make sabaki on the right side. So it was a very calm and um, efficient move for black to protect the corner. This is a move that's it's a worth worthwhile thing to do anyway. So black played there, reducing white's go threats, and white's going to play another move on the right side. So when white plays here, this is taking away black's eye space. But uh, when black curls around here. This is um, creating a peep at S9. So the fact that black did not cut at S10 to start the call um, had the merit of leaving this peep here on the second line. So for instance, if white were to play here and start extending along the fifth line, then black could play here. Um, for instance, if white had to connect up at S13, it would be a bit painful. So white's not really attacking black very efficiently here. And white bumped against. Okay, so white has a living shape there. And black switched to the upper left. So this is always, it's always a fairly big move. If black had played elsewhere, um, there would be the fact that at some point white can try stuff like this. So for instance, in this variation, Well, black might actually extend, but say if it was something like this, um, it does look like there's maybe black's a bit too over concentrated on the top there. So in that way, uh, playing the uh, Kosumi here, it's a very uh, good Aji. It's also starting to attack the white group. So this was an interesting move. 
Um, we know that black could not connect here because of this. Um, but there was some manji. So like anything that happens in this general area, um, sometimes the latter can have something to do with it. So like if white has not played two yet and plays it only after black plays it one, then sometimes the, the latter can, if the latter is good for black, that is, it's bad for black at this point. But sometimes this can um, create some kind of a squeeze from the center. So there's some Aji there. So um, this uh, gets rid of the Aji. It also threatens uh, K18, which is a move that it doesn't really work um, directly, but it works in a way. So it's going to be interesting. And so white is sort of asking how black responds. So if black is going to play something like this, then white will have more freedom to play moves in the vicinity because of that exchange. Just because white didn't want to leave the possibility of, in some cases, black connecting at O18. So black jumps here, and white starts this on the top side. This is an interesting position where black played here, and this captures the four white stones. So this is the intuitive move that I would have played too. Interesting to see that the computer suggests this move also. And Black can start a co and has an advantage in this co and that white doesn't really have so many good co threats. White will play at eight to make dodge in the corner. Uh, but black still has co threats such as f18 and um, and playing a target g17 would be a co threat. So black has some local co threats. And it, uh, playing the co, it turns out that was also an option. In a way, this would be putting more pressure on the white group as a whole. But for a human player, I think it's more natural to play the to play the way that captures the four stones. Uh, it also demonstrates how White was planning to make use of those that Aji there on the top side, because although Black has captured the White stones, White has a potential life there. So if White adds a stone here, and then squeezes from this side and could play something like this. So this would be a way for white to make two eyes. So the the fact that um, black has captured the four stones, that's good for black, but white does have this squeeze that can make two eyes. And he played away. So he's making me eye of that squeeze and breaking out into the center. So if black were to play something like this, then white would continue like that and have a living shape. Uh, maybe here. Um, so yeah, so the point of that is that he also had a potential squeeze from the center. So in the game, uh, we'll see that. So when black plays here to take away white's eye space, now white plays here. And the fact that white's group on the top still has three liberties, that's why white didn't play the squeeze here yet. The fact that white's group has three liberties means that this four liberty black group, black does have to be a bit careful of how he continues in the center. So that's what White was doing with the double Hana here. Um, so for instance, just to show the worst possible thing for Black to do would be to capture the one stone and the ladder here, and White would push through here, and Black would um, be starting to get into trouble because Black would, at this point, would have to connect here. And so, um, so much for that attack. It would, it would not be working as an attack at all. So he plays an Atari from this side and extend. So Black's still trying to put pressure on the white group, and white is playing these moves in the center while fighting the ko. So white should have no problem living because he has ko threats here in the center. So it's a question of how Black handles that. So for instance, if Black connects here, uh, white can always play these forcing moves. And for instance, this would be one way white could live. So at this point, white's going to have no trouble making two eyes. So instead, Black is, instead of continuing the core, actually, he just take, plays this big move. It's uh, not really, it's not easy to say whether this is a core threat or just, just a big move. So at any point, White can capture B19 and be alive, but he extended here. So this is um, threatening, it's not a ladder, but it's usually a net. So uh, let's see, black played away again. So black has established some profit on the right side. 
these four white stones, they're not completely dead, but they will eventually have to run out towards the center. So Black's group is strong, and the four stones are weak. And the fact that Black's whole group on the right side is strong now, it's going to make it more difficult for White to make any territory. Um, so if we look at the territory, White just has this one territory in the top right. Black has territories elsewhere. And the fact that Black has a strong position on the right side, it means White's final area is going to be on the bottom side, but Black is going to reduce that uh, because Black has a strong position on the side. Okay, so White cuts here and extends. So locally, this is not a ladder. So for instance, if Black had to, if there was meaning, if Black could kill the group on the top, that is, then Black could play here and it would not be a ladder. And th this is going to hit the Black stones in the lower right corner. So it's not going to work as a ladder. Um, but it's not really worth it for Black to do that because White's group on the top is going to live anyway. So Black just forgets those two stones. And so um, both Black and White are sort of ignoring the fact that these two stones can be captured because um, the bottom side is actually more important. So White continues from the bottom side and is trying to squeeze Black. But White does have a lot of cutting points. So in the game, White played here. Um, and playing here would be another way to do it, but that would leave a lot of bad Aji later on with this move. So for the time, by, for, for the time being, Black would play here. And this would calm down the position in the center. It would indirectly save this group. Uh, so black, this black group is stronger than two white stones, so it's alive. And white would have to answer on this side with something like, something like this. White probably needs one more move, so yeah, something like this. And black would be able to play away. And so like, this would be a lot of bad Aji. It's probably going to be bad for white. White has bad shape on both sides. So he just took in a ladder. So this allowed Black to cut here, but those two stones, they're not as important as White's position on the bottom side. So I agree with that choice, and Black connected. So this is just played because it's forcing. It's gonna force White to live here and add one more stone. So White added a stone there. And okay, so Black slides in. So we're gonna get some life and death on the bottom side. Black slides all the way to here. So it's an interesting example of two things. One is the life on the second line, and the fact that when white has this very strong position, even though it's so high up on the sixth line like that, when white has this strong position, it's a good idea for black to invade mostly on the second line. So all of black's stones will be played on the second line. For instance, if white plays here, black's going to play another move on the second line, maybe this one. Um, because if Black plays on the third line, that's going to allow White to scoop out the eye space. So, like, Black doesn't really want to try to be connecting to the corner. So, like, if Black does something like this, this is really annoying. Jumping here is, um, it can be done, but, like, it's it's not the most exciting move. So, Black doesn't really want to live in that direction. Also, this one, again, White's going to play here and cut off the one Black song. So that's how the third line is just not working for black in this case. And the second line, so for instance, if we say something like this happens, black has six stones on the second line and seven now. So black needs one more stone to have a living shape. So that's a living shape. So they say six dies and eight lives. And seven, it depends who plays first. So that was black 12 in this diagram. Okay, so white played from this side, and black jumped into the 3-3 point. This was a Tessuji. Um, black captured, and white was able to capture the one black stone. Black played here, so I would have been a bit more straightforward in trying to live on the bottom side. But when I asked Kalago, it was actually a bit more devious, and it played this one. Uh, in some cases, the idea seems to be to sacrifice black's group on the side, and to take the left side on a large scale. So um, that was interesting. Um, and it does involve, for instance, this Hane, uh, which is threatening to connect up to the corner. So there's some Aji there, which would be valuable for Black. I guess Black would pull back here. So um, in some cases, Black could have even sacrificed the side. I didn't really see that coming. 
but this was working in its own way. So uh, Black's alive here. Actually, the way that the Black lived was not optimal. So it would have been slightly better for Black to pull back here. And this is alive as it is. So for instance, if White plays here to try to kill Black, um, Black has a forcing move at e5. So this is just not going to work for White. So Black can play like this. And in this case, White's in a shortage of liberty. So and that would just be like whatever Black does, it's going to be good now. Or even if white plays something like this, it's still the same thing. So like a black can play here, threatening j6. And this is going to be a lot of trouble for white. This is just going to be, it's going to be a collapse. So white can't go after this group. So at this point, white would just leave it after black won here. And it would be alive. So this was probably a couple of points better than the game. Black did lose um, two or three points, I think, and it was a slightly painful way for Black to make two eyes. However, he's still winning at this point. So this is, um, like I said, the strategy here, the variation where Black sacrificed those cutting stones was surprisingly good for Black. It was a great success. And if Black had simply played like this and allowed White to escape out, while reducing the white territory on the left and on the, on the left bottom side. Uh, this would have been good enough for a win. He was a few points ahead. Instead, he tried for something better, this move, which is really complicated and it seems to not work. So it involves a co, so it's not easy to understand, but it wasn't going for, very well for black. So he is trying to make the whole white group heavy and attack strongly. And it's complica complicated by the fact that black's group on this side is actually not 100% alive yet because the two white stones on the second line here can sometimes escape to the corner. So if white plays at S13, that's gonna connect up to the top right corner. So they're fighting a co, and you can see how white is trying to put some pressure on that black group. It already doesn't have um, clear ice, ice space. Also, White's setting up to capture a black stone here, and so the move that White has just played at S9 is going to have something to do with White's ice space. Okay. So they're continuing the call. Yeah. So that's that's all those co threats in that area of the board. White had a co threat here, and so Black ran out of co threats. So Black connected and white pushed through and cut. So this is not working for black. It's already bad for black. Okay, so white connected first and then took here. So white is extending his liberties and by capturing that stone at T7, white has weakened this the three stones here. So if black continues to try to kill white, it would be this move and white would play here and black would have no good way of saving those five stones on the left. So um, it's this cut here which is going to cause trouble. So at this point, for instance, it might be this call, but white would have a co threat here. So the call is going to work for white. Black doesn't have any co threat big enough for this. Black would lose the whole corner, the whole lower right corner. So that would be bad. Um, so if black plays from the other side, then white's going to break through here. So wherever black plays the stone at five at this point, it's going to be the same problem. So like in this case, it would be the same variation where white would be able to cut black here. So wherever you place that stone instead of five, it's going to be the same story. So the, the other option might be this one. It's still the same thing. So white's going to start with the cut and extending down here, and eventually we'll be able to cut black off. So there's no good way to, to avoid that. In the game, black pushed through and cut and played here. And so black cannot play at T9 because of this. And so this actually, well, in this case, black's already played filled the liberty with M5. So white could even start from 
Maybe white could start from this one. This would be a different variation. But at the very least, white can play here. And black has no good way to connect up. Okay, so white lives. Um, black can't even play this forcing move because white's going to answer it here and it's going to still be alive. Yeah, so with, with um, t10 and t6 being the eye. So black couldn't even play that forcing endgame move. Uh, this is so big, m2 is so big, black had to play here first. And when white extends. So at the uh, final part of the game, suddenly white has a lead because black's attack on the right side, it failed. White kept the territory here. So white kept this part of the territory. Black did gain a little bit here, but black's, black actually lost a lot on the right side too. So on the whole, this attack was a failure and it changed a few points victory for black into a few points victory for white. So just a few more moves and that's it. So uh, this is where black resigned. Um, it was a, a splendidly good game for KJ, but he uh, threw away at the end of the game. So um, I'm, I suppose that was disappointing. Uh, but on the whole, it was a very well played, I'd, I'd say. So thank you for watching. I will continue in a, another video with game two of this title match. Thank you.